Hello, good evening. Uh, tonight I bring you a discussion on the Anglo-Saxon Chronicles. Uh, I'm very lucky to be joined by my guest here, Nord Huger. Uh, how are you this evening, sir? Hey, doing well. Thank you so much, Hitman, for inviting me on. This is going to be a lot of fun. Yes, absolutely. And um, so just regarding the, um, the Anglo-Saxon Chronicles themselves, so um, when did you first sort of re read or hear about it? You know, I couldn't tell you, to be honest, the first time that I heard about them. Uh, it might have been from reading up on, on some other books and had seen that the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle was being referenced a bunch. So about two years ago, I just went on Amazon, picked up a copy. Uh, the translation I have is the 1823 and 18, a mix of an 1823 and 1847 translation by James Ingram and Dr. J.A. Giles. And... Yeah, it's it's really a fascinating book just because or a series of books, kind of like a Bible of sorts of of Anglo-Saxon history. It's just incredible because of how much like the breadth and the detail that it covers. Um, yeah, it's certainly because um, it goes all the way from Julius Caesar's um, landing in Britain in 60 BC all the way up into the accession of um King Henry the Second in the uh, the twelfth century, so it's a rather huge, broad um, sweep through um, early medieval um, English history. Um, me personally, um, I was aware of the chronicles for many years because I've always found um, Anglo-Saxon history fascinating. But when I was younger, I tend to read more secondary material than primary primary material. Um, I think that was mainly because. A lot of primary material has a more archaic writing style, which I found a bit off-putting, but as I've matured, I've come to appreciate it more. So I actually um, read the Chronicles for the first time the end of last year, and um, my copy was actually a pretty modern edition that was only um, printed in 2022. Excellent. Yeah. Did you find when you were reading it, because it seemed to me as I was going through that parts of it would be incredibly gripping with so many things happening at once and then and then it would slow down and then you get the annual records and you'd just see okay so and so archbishop died at this year and then the abbey uh received gold at this year and their the crops fared this well and then you get huge stretches where basically you know peacetime where nothing would happen and then suddenly you'd see this incredible gem of some some fascinating bit of history kind of pop up throughout i mean what was your what was your moment to moment reading experience like um yeah i think it's about about the same you have the gripping events and then you have the, uh, the not so gripping events um of the, that the expression that comes to mind um there are um there are years where days happen and there are days when years happen i think it's very true of the anglo-saxon oh, chronicles totally um, yeah it, it does feel very much though like essential reading for just to get to the primary source of this history. No, absolutely. Um, well, I would be remiss if I didn't mention um, another um, major source of Anglo-Saxon history, which is um, Bede's Ecclesiastical History of the English People, which is I also read around the same time as um, the Anglo-Saxon Chronicles. That's also a very wonderful and, in fact, very cosy read. Um, a bit different because it was written significantly earlier um, so it doesn't quite cover the same stretch of history, but what it does cover is much more um, in, in depth. Um, so have you have you read that at all? Or? I haven't. Uh, what year was that written in? Uh, 735, from what I recall. Oh, okay, yeah. So so pre, pre-Viking invasions. Mm -hmm. Interesting, yeah. Um, yeah, so with the ecclesiastical history... Um, is good if you want to read, again, about the early Anglo-Saxon period, especially about how they converted to Christianity and the loss of the infighting uh, in the uh, in the 7th century. Uh, so, yes, you should definitely read it at some point. It's uh, wonderful. Uh, so I just want to um, move on. I have a presentation up here. So uh, on the front, you see there's an image of what's called the Peterborough Chronicles. So with the um, Anglo-Saxon Chronicles, because it's not just one, uh, there are many of them. So the origin is, is they were they were believed to have been commissioned by Alfred the Great um, during his reign. Um, and so the reason why he commissioned them is 
obviously, as you know, in the run-up to his reign, um, you have the invasion of the Great Heathen Army, where the sons of Ragnar Lothbrok um, were wreaking revenge for the death of their father and death years before. Um, so they invade, um, they destroy the kingdom of Northumbria, uh, Blood Eagling, King Ayla. They then head south and conquer East Anglia, conquer most of Mercia. And then it's just Wessex being the lone Anglo-Saxon kingdom left to resist the invasion. And so there is this idea of the Chronicles being there to com to sort of essentially write down uh, the history of the Anglo-Saxon people. So they would have their own sort of written history to sort of rally around and inspire them. Or what's your thoughts on that? Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I mean, it is pretty pivotal moment there. Mm, indeed, and um, so just going back to the then chronicles. So it, certainly, there would have been one original chronicle, which unfortunately no longer is this that has lives that has been lost to history. Uh, however, uh, on this slide, uh, so on the right hand side. Uh, there was a map, uh, so there were several chronicles written and, and commissioned to different places. So uh, during this time, um, most of the literate population would have been clergymen, so they were the ones who have actually, would have actually written down the, the um, chronicles themselves. So I, I mentioned before in the ecclesiastical history by the Venerable Bede, well, he himself was a, was a priest, uh, um, a scholar at um, the priory at uh, Jarrow Wearmouth in, in Northumbria, as it would have been people like him who would have been commissioning the, these chronicles. And so you can see here that there's Winchester, uh, Worcester, Peterborough, uh, Abingdon and Canterbury were the main locations, um, which, as I said, they also are made sites of major um, cathedrals in England. So obviously there's Canterbury Cathedral, Winchester, Winchester Cathedral, Worcester Cathedral. Um, and so though these were written by um, clergymen in, in these um, priories, uh, the works themselves have later been moved on and kept um, elsewhere. So you can see there's Oxford, London and Cambridge. So if you go to these places, you can actually um, see the, the, the remaining chronicles that, that, that still exist. Hmm. And um, here is like a, is a diagram of how, because all the chronicles, they all cover the same events, but obviously as they're written by different people and are using different source materials, they do all vary slightly. Uh, so you can see the original text, then from there you've got um, Asser's Life of Alfred, uh, Athelweird's Chronicle, Annals of St. Neots. So, and as we can see, Annals of St. Neots has no version spring off from there, so that, I believe that may be lost. However, from the original text, you see the Winchester, there's the Parker Chronicle, and then there's a copy of that. Then going down, you see all the other versions that have been, been written. So every version that has a, a letter next to it is a surviving version that is still still around today. Hmm. Um, yeah, so um, in your um, translation, does it say if it's based on any of these particular chronicles at all? Or? It's, uh, it doesn't specify which particular chronicles, but it lays out, it's structured essentially in a year-to-year -year form, drawing from drawing from all of the all of the chronicles that are are still intact from what i understand mm. yeah because my version it doesn't make it clear and, and as i've mentioned before we went live that um there are actually some events for example where there's a passage where it mentions a year and some events or events and then there'll be other passages for the same year that will say the same events, but written slightly differently. So what I suspect mm. the publisher of my version has done is have taken different versions of the same events from different chronicles and just put them all together in the same book. Yeah, mine, mine has the exact same thing. So AD 140 has two trans or two different versions of it. AD 1041, AD 1043. Uh, so I would, especially once you get later, into later into the into the timeline you get this doubling up of different versions and accounts of the events and they it's sort of like how the gospels will recount some of the same events but tell them a bit differently although occasionally you do see some contradictions uh, you know certainly because you'll find that some 
events may mention something where another one another one doesn't so there's a little bit of an inconsistency but i think it's good to have all of it and then you can make your own judgment rather than have something missing by having something omitted yeah no i do like the way they handle it in that giving you the full breadth of it okay so uh here um on this slide uh, I actually have, so in my version, this is the um, contents. And what I've done is I've decided to take a note of how many pages were dedicated to each section and and roughly how much time in history that section covers, because I think that there's an interesting uh, how they've handled it. So you can see that of a book that's nearly 300 pages long, uh, they only dedicate eight pages to Roman Britain, which is a period of nearly 500 years long. So that's... Um, <laughs> Quite an oh, abridged section of history. Oh, that kills me. I, I wish that's what I was when I was going through the readings and going through the the sort of primordial history of Britain pre pre and leading up to the Germanic invasion. I was I was so desperate for more text around that area. So I'll I'll have to look elsewhere to dig up what I can find from that era. Cause it, it, there's so much that happens there. That's kind of shrouded in the mists of time. Mm. Uh, again, going back to the classical history, uh, that book actually does cover the Roman period a bit better than the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle. That's definitely more than eight pages. I can tell you from reading it, <laughs> though, it uh, though it's still not, it's not the bulk of that book. So it's better, but probably still not the best source. Um, a source I probably would recommend looking at, especially if you want, say, the late Roman period, is um, there is um, a work called On the Ruin of Britain by a 6th century a monk called Gildas. And um, it, though that is him, because he was a, it was mostly him sort of ranting and raving about the, the ruin that Britain had fallen into after the Romans had left. And it, it makes everything sound like everything's gone to complete bedlam. So. <laughs> um, it, it's like the the monk version of oh what's yeah have have you seen the documentary about the Chinese that move into that move into the Congo and are looking at the ruins of colonial Africa and are just distraught by it? Uh, no, I'm not seeing that. No, what's it called? There's a there's this sort of classic documentary from. 2010 it's where the it's where the it's also tiresome meme oh right okay and he's just you see this chinese man who's doing all this contracting work with the local africans to build things and he's he's just looking at the state of some of the infrastructure that had been left the railroads the telegraph lines etc from the colonial era and seeing that it had fallen into disrepair and he's just he's just so distraught by it he's sort of like sounds like the sixth century monk looking at the roman ruins and just going ah you let it crumble look at all this infrastructure these aqueducts oh, sounds uh, fascinating i should probably give that uh, a watch at some point uh though uh, coming to my mind um have you um, read any oswald spengler at all uh, nord Hugo? i have i've heard people quote him but i haven't read any of it directly because in The Man and Technics, um, which is quite a short read if you ever want to read anything by him, um, he does something similar. He's sort of, he's writing in the 30s and he's sort of lamenting how he thinks Western civilization is really in quite sharp, severe decline. And he says, oh, in, in centuries time, you know, all that's going to be left is our skyscrapers and our huge buildings. That's the only thing that we're left of Western civilization. It's all just going to go to ruin, essentially. Hmm. Yeah, you, I mean, you see that so much in post-apocalyptic literature and media. You just see the, the ruins of the skyscrapers covered in vines and decaying. And it, it's quite an evocative sight. I mean, you can imagine a similar feeling of this sort of almost post-apocalyptic post living in the ruins feeling of Roman Britain after after the fall of the Empire, after, after they get kicked out. Mm. Yeah, especially certainly if um, you're a native Briton, because they must have felt pretty abandoned after the Romans withdrew and uh, had to deal with the uh, the Saxon menace. So, uh, yes. Yeah, so moving on. So the rest of these sections. So uh, heptarchy. So that 
starts with the landing of Hengist and Horsa and then ends just before the first Viking raid on, on Lindisfarne. So at 44 pages, that's a bit more in-depth, though it's still relatively sparse, I think, compared to um, the Ecclesiastical History by Bede. So again, that's a, a better text, I think, if you want to read about that period. Um, and then when you sort of get to the Viking invasions onwards, you start to get a bit more um, meat, and it, things start to get a bit more interesting, because um, there are many um, wild battles and um, interesting figures that, that come up. So You get the blow-by-blow so you... blow of the yes. campaigns. Mm. Uh, what what's the reason? Uh, I'm not familiar with the word heptarchy. Uh, what what does heptarchy mean? Okay, so uh, the heptarchy was, uh, in fact, let's move forward a page because I've got an image. So, okay, uh, so on these uh, images, you, this is the evolution of Anglo-Saxon Britain um, throughout. Uh, th this period. So on the left-hand side, this is around 540 at the time of when Gildas, who I've mentioned before, was writing. So all of the red texts are tribes or areas controlled by Saxons. Uh, the uh, the purpley colour are Jutes and the... the sorry, so red, red is the Angles, uh, the, or, the brown colour are Saxons and the purple colour are the Jutes. So, so the Anglo-Saxon peoples are roughly controlled the eastern side of England, whereas the Britons are holding out in the southwest, uh, in Wales, and in, and even in, even in the northwest. Um, then going forward into uh, the seventh uh, century, uh, you can see that a bit more is under their control now. They've managed to push into the southwest, but though the counties of Devon and Cornwall there in the southwest are still holding out and would do for centuries while still in the northwest around modern day Lancashire um and um Cumbria um they're still holding out but by the image on the right which would be certainly by the end of the um the 7th century or the 8th century uh, pretty much all of what is modern day England and even some of the lowland Scotland has been, has been taken over by the Saxons and heptarchy so the etymology if we go back to the ancient Greek so hept uh, is seven and archi from arc or uh, essentially a power or so power of seven because after the Saxon uh, power tribes um, had settled themselves by this time, they'd formed into seven distinct kingdoms. So these kingdoms are um, East Anglia, Essex, Kent, Sussex, Wessex, Mercia and Northumbria. So, that, so it's the seven kingdoms of England. So that's what heptarchy means, essentially. And it was also during this time, um, through the uh, institution of a Wetan Gemot, they would also, the most powerful Anglo-Saxon king would be given this title of uh, Brettvalder or Britain ruler, is what it believes to mean, which is sort of an acknowledgement of who was the most powerful of, of the kings. And there would always be a new um, one selected when the old one died. So one example was... Um, I don't know if you're aware of King Offer of Mercia, who was a very long ruling Anglo-Saxon king in the eighth century. Um, he rules from about 753 and dies in around uh, 796, I believe, just after the raid on Lindisfarne. Um, he was um, one Britain ruler, and he ruled at a time called the Mercian um, hegemony, which is the time when Mercia was most dominant. Hmm. And he built uh, fortification along the border of Mercy and Wales, isn't that correct? Uh, like a dike yeah. of some sort? Yeah, Offers Dyke, yes. Impressive. I, is that earthwork still around? Um, I believe so. Um, I, I don't think there's a physical structure there, but if you go, I think there's like a, a ridge of land where you can see it's clearly been uh, shaped from something that, that once was there. Hmm. Well, the, certainly the maps are very much appreciated when going through this. I, I always love to kind of get as much of a, a visual understanding of the land and the shifts in territory that are being described. Because, I mean, throughout the course of the Chronicles, I mean, it's it's wild just the extent to which boundaries are, are constantly shifting and changing and new territories being carved out. Yes, certainly. And... um. The seventh century is particularly wild because um, 
but by that point, um, some of the Saxon kings had converted to Christianity, such as um, King Ethelbert of Kent, famously in 596, with um, um, St. Augustine, so St. Augustine of Canterbury, not to be confused with St. Augustine of Hippo, uh, the author of the City of God, the probably more well-known St. Augustine, um, admission to um, Kent in five, 596. And also you have um, King Serdic, um, who establishes the West Saxons, the Kingdom of Wessex, um, also converts to Christianity in the 6th century. But many other kings, including most notably, um, you've got King Pender of Mercia, um, do not convert. And there are many wars and between these Saxon tribes as they're fighting for supremacy. Uh, and the, there's actually a couple of segments I do want to read from this heptarchy bit. I'm just going to pull them up. And while you're pulling that up, uh, it's interesting to just as we're going through the as we're going through the timeline, the chronicles do a great job of laying out the secession of kings, and they always trace their lineage back to Woden, which is really fascinating. So they have this sort of divine lineage and even while they're christian they're still tracing they're still tracing their kings back to uh what we would think of as a, as a pagan god but in some sense is this great progenitor king um yes no no certainly i would thought that was fascinating it, so it's an attempt to reconcile the pagan past with the um the, the christian contemporary uh, so they're, they're, they're acknowledging the new Christian faith, but they're not completely turning their back on their on their past or heritage, which which is which is good. And that's that's something that's extremely similar to what you see in the Prose Edda, in which Snorri Sturluson does a very similar thing by incorporating and new hemorizing or histor putting into history the some of these same semi mythological figures of Odin and Thor and Freyr as these progenitor semi-divine kings who leave from Troy at the fall of Troy and travel east and north or west and north excuse me and create these great lineages and are the the forebears of the modern Nordic nations we see today but then it also it, it has this kind of beautiful synchronicity with the same events and the same lineages that are described here. And I'll have to look into this, but correct, correct me if I'm wrong here, but I do recall there being some, there being some letter that was sent by, um, dur during the Roman era by one of the, one of the Britons to Rome essentially saying we should have peace because we are both descended from Troy. Now I'll have to check, I'll have to check if that's correct, but is that something that you've heard of that letter? Uh, yes, I, I think I have read that somewhere, but it's not the first time. There are many um, people who claim their lineage from, from Troy. Uh, later on, you've got, um, I think it's William of uh, Monmouth, uh, who in his, I think it's History of the Kings of Britain, he claims that, um, the origins of the Britons was a, a Prince Brutus from, who travelled there after the, the the sack and fall of Troy. So it's something that comes up a, a lot throughout history and, and myth. Ah, no, it is it is this kind of fascinating story, and just that they had the the awareness and considered Troy to be very real. I mean, it's, it's a bit off topic from the broader history, but it does kind of go into the primordial origins of how they viewed themselves, how, how the people of the North viewed themselves. No, precisely. And so I've got the passages now. So, okay. So, 8449, this year, Martin and Valentinian assumed the empire and reigned seven winters. In their days, Hengist and Horsa, invited by Vertgern, king of the Britons, to his assistance, landed in Britain in the place that is called Ips Winesfleet. First of all, to support the Britons, 
but they afterwards fought against them. The king directed them to fight against the Picts, and they did so, and obtained the victory wheresoever they came. They then sent to the Angles and desired them to send more assistance. They described the worthlessness of the Britons and the richness of the land. They then sent them greater support. Then came the men from free powers of Germany, the old Saxons, the Angles, and the Jutes. From the Jutes are descended the men of Kent, the White Warians, that is the tribe that now dwelleth in the Isle of Wight, and that kindred in Wessex, that men yet call the kindred of the Jutes. From the old Saxons came the people of Essex and Sussex and Wessex. From Anglia, which has ever since remained waste between the Jutes and the Saxons, came the East Angles, the Middle Angles, the Mercians, and all of those north of the Humber. Their leaders were two brothers, Hengist and Horsa, who were the sons of Vitgils. Vitgils was the son of Witta, Witta of Wacta, Wacta of Woden. From this Woden arose all our royal kindred and that of the Southumbrians also. AD 449, and in their days, Vortigern invited the Angles thither, and they came to Britain in three churls at the place called Wiffid's Fleet. This year, so AD 455, this year Hengist and Horsa fought with Vertgen the king on the spot that is called Aylesford, his brother Horsa being there slain. Hengist afterwards took to the kingdom of his son Esk. AD 457, this year Hengist and Esk fought with the Britons on the spot that is called Crayford, and there slew 4,000 men. The Britons then forsook the land of Kent and in great consternation fled to London. AD 465, this year Hengist and Esk fought with the Welsh, Nile Vipt fleet, and there slew twelve leaders, all Welsh. On their side, a thane was there slain, whose name was whipped. AD 473, this year, Hengist and Esk fought with the Welsh and took immense booty, and then the Welsh felt, fled from the English like fire. Uh, that's the end of the bit on Hengist uh, and Horsa. Uh, so, so, as you can see there, the first section was quite lengthy, uh, but then all the other little bits are relatively shorter. And um, I, I do like the little um, poetic turn there with them, um, and the Welsh fled from the English like fire. <laughs> <laughs> and you also get just the, the beautiful alliteration with names. You have Whitgills was the son of Witta, Witta of Wecta, Wecta of Woden. So it's, <laughs> it's just this kind of lovely, lovely language scheme that they have going on. Uh, yeah, so the next bit I want to read, you see it again with um, King Serdic and his son Sinric, uh, which is, okay, so this is, so, AD 495, this year came two leaders into Britain, Serdic and Sinric his son, with five ships, at a place that is called Serdic's Or, and they fought with the Welsh the same day, then he died, and his son Sinric succeeded to the government, and held it six and twenty winters, then he died, and Siolin, his son, succeeded and who reigned 17 years. Then he died and Cael succeeded to the government and reigned five years. When he died, Caelwulf, his brother, succeeded and reigned 17 years. The kin goeth to Serdic, then succeeded Sinbils, or Kinbils, Caelwulf's brother's son, to the kingdom and reigned one and thirty winters. And he first of West Saxon kings received baptism then succeeded um, Kenwall, who was the son of Kingils, and reigned one and thirty winters. Then held Sexburger, his queen, the government one year after him. Then succeeded Exwine to the kingdom, whose kin grew to Serdic, and held it two years. Then succeeded uh, Cantwine, the son of Kingils, to the kingdom of the West Saxons, and reigned nine years. Then succeeded uh, Kedwall to the government, whose kith grew to Serdic, and held it for three years. Then succeeded Ina to the kingdom of the West Saxons, whose kin goeth to Serdic and reigned 37 winters. Then succeeded Ethelherd, whose kin goeth to Serdic and reigned 16 years. Then succeeded Cuthred, whose kin goeth to Serdic and reigned 16 winters. Then succeeded um, Sigebret, whose kin goeth to Serdic and reigned one year. Then succeeded kin Kinwolf, whose kin goeth to Serdic and reigned one and 30 winters. Then succeeded uh, Britric, whose kin go to Serdic and reigned 16 years. Then succeeded Egbert to the kingdom and held it seven and thirty winters and seven months. Then succeeded Ethelwolf, was the son of Egbert. Egbert of Aelmund, Aelmund of Ether, Ether of Ioppa, Ioppa of Ingild, Ingild of Senrid, 
Inner of Kenred, Cuthberger of Kenred, and Quenberger of Senred, Kenred of Caerwald, Caerwald of Cuthwalf, Cuthwalf of Cuthwine, Cuthwine of Kelm, Kelm of Kinric, Kinric of Creoda, Creoda of Serdic, then succeeded Ethelbald, the son of Ethelwolf, to the kingdom, and held it five years, then succeeded Ethelbert, his brother, and reigned five years, then, then succeeded Ethelred, his brother, to the kingdom, and held it five years, then succeeded Alfred, their brother, to the government, and then has el elapsed his age three and twenty winters, and 396 winters from the time when his kindred first gained the land of Wessex from the Welsh, and he had held the kingdom a year and a half, less than 30 winters, then succeeded Edward, the son of Alfred, and reigned 24 winters. When he died, then succeeded Ethelstan, his son, and reigned 14 years and seven weeks and three days. Then succeeded Edmund, his brother, and reigned six years and a half, wanting two knights. Then succeeded Edred, his brother, and reigned nine years and six weeks. Then succeeded Edwy, the son of Edmund, and reigned three years and 36 weeks, wanting two days. When he died, then succeeded Edgar, his brother, and reigned 16 years and eight weeks and two nights. When he died, then succeeded Edward, son of Edgar, and reigned. So that's quite a lengthy there, but you can see the incredible attention to detail of the lineage of the dynasty there, not only going back, but they're actually going forward as well, because if you listen to some of the names there, uh, they're even going right up to the Alfred the Great and um, his son Edward the Elder and eventually um, King Athelstan. Um, so I think it's very important to bear in mind, obviously, that this obviously bears prudence to the fact that Alfred the Great was the one who commissioned this because uh, why would they put so much emphasis on mentioning him, the lineage, so early? Indeed, indeed. And it, it also has this... It's it's a view by tracing lineage back to progenitor kings who are rooted in the divine, who are these sort of otherworldly mythological status heroes and kings. It, it's this. It is it is a view of history that's very alien to modern man who views himself as ascending. And improving generationally when you see in this in this model it's it's you have that which is high which precedes everything else. And it, it's sort of an Evolian sense of history, or you could say it's it's similar to when Tolkien has the Valar and you see that you see that the line of Gondor is descended from a type of man who was higher than the status of of man in the later ages. Uh, yes, ab absolutely. Um, obviously, being descended, descended from the full blooded kings of, kings of Numenor, and obviously, as time goes on, and they they marry the, the blood dwindles dwindles and, and is weaker. But no, thank you. That was a, a really nice analogy. Uh, so, uh, was there anything else you wanted to bring up during this period, or shall we move on to the uh, the next slide? Yeah, we can certainly continue on. Okay, so here we deal with the Viking invasion. So um, on the left-hand side here, this is the ruin of Lind Lindisfarne Priory, which was um, on a small island in the north, off the north uh, eastern coast of Britain um, in, in, in Northumbria. It was the very first Viking raid onto um, British soil. And um, I actually want to read the entry for this. Uh, just bring it up for one moment. Oh, it just as one last aside on the Roman Britain matter. Uh, there, if if you're a gamer out there, for all you gamer lads out there, uh, if you want to play a game that has a segment with Roman Britain, albeit you know historical fiction and very much uh you know it's not exact don't treat it as history but if you want a, a little bit of some fun roman britain action uh you should definitely check out the game rise son of rome which came out like 10 years ago it was like a launch title for the old for the last generation of xboxes but it's it's got some pretty fun segments where you're you're a roman legionary and you're going through the deep dark woods of Britain and you're encountering 
you're encountering this like giant wicker man and you're like fighting these Britons who are who are just like totally wild and it's 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 fun. I'll I'll say that. It's it's not a again, it's not history exactly, but it's it's certainly an entertaining artistic portrayal of something that you don't really see covered in media. Um, I've not actually played that game, but um, I have a friend who did play it, and I did watch it. They did stream it, so I did watch a little bit of it. So I know I know what you mean. But um, <laughs> uh, yeah, so here we go. So AD seven nine three. This year came dreadful forewarnings over the land of the Northumbrians, terrifying the people most woefully. These were immense sheets of light rushing through the air, and whirlwinds and fiery dragons flying across the firmament. These tremendous tokens were soon followed by a great famine, and not long after, on the sixth day before the Ides of January in the same year, the harrowing inroads of heathen men made lamentable havoc in the Church of God in Holy Island by rapine and slaughter. Sigurd died on the eighth day before the Calends of March. So there, this at the very beginning of this section on the Viking invasions, you've got this very vivid um, portrayal of apocalypse and, and tomb, especially with the mention of, of dragons there as well. Yeah, it, it also taps into the the great thing about reading direct sources and not just secondary sources is that, and and especially just as you go through year by year and you see the notes that are put down, you really get a glimpse into the pre-modern mind of the men of this place and time who had a idea of the world around them or a conception of the world around them that was it it had enormous room for what we would call fantasy or or the fantastical you know sci like uh, you see constantly throughout the anglo-saxon chronicles you see mentions of cosmological events and signs in the heavens an asteroid flies past and this is an omen for greater things to come or mention of as you see dragons you know things that to the people of the time they certainly didn't necessarily perceive them as as mythological creatures they're like oh no you know this is just this is just part of the world we live in it's they lived in a much more a much more wild and fantastical frame of mind um, yes, they uh, they they didn't need a source for everything. They just they had profound <laughs> beliefs which they went along with. Um, um, monk, do you have a source for the for the dragons you saw flying overhead? <laughs> Indeed, uh, but uh, enough of making fun of uh, modern midwits. But um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah they few... don't appreciate. Yeah, I mean, science guys today they don't appreciate the importance of of dragons in the heavens. No, indeed not. But um, yes. Um, so obviously during this period, um, other than Lindisfarne, there were many um, Viking raids into Britain, um, sort of killing many, um, destroying a lot of churches, um, acquiring much bo booty and, and wealth. Uh, but the culmination of this, as I mentioned before, is um, obviously at this time you've got the great um, Viking um, leader Ragnar Lothbrok, um, who is. Um, on a raid into Northumberland, um, he's defeated in battle by King Ayla. Um, King Ayla punishes him by having him thrown into a pit of, um, I believe it's um, adders or, or vipers, and he's yeah. bitten to death. Um, and um, and very forebodingly, um, his final words are, "Oh, how the the little pigs will weep to oink to, oink to hear that how the old boar suffered." <laughs> it's such it's such a beautiful it's such an amazing. Uh, line and and so it's present and you know whether or not that's what he actually said it's just presented with this this sense of uh, incredible defiance and a sense of almost self satisfied mirth that you know King Ayla and the Northumbrians are going to get what's coming to them for for killing. Uh, for killing him in such a manner it's it's just a it's a his death poem is you know it's an iconic piece of literature um yes indeed because um obviously as you know with the vikings they believed you would only go to valhalla had you died in battle and so considering he was sort of tortured in a 
quite humiliating way. It's, it's understandable that his sons were not too best pleased. Mm -hmm. So um, years later, in about um, the 860s, um, you have the landing of the Great Heathen Army. So this is unlike Lord anything. Lord behold, that... who's leading the army? But Ragnar's sons. Yeah, in, indeed. Um, well, they st and the thing is, they, in terms of a revenge, it is a wild revenge because not only do they invade Northumbria, defeat King Ayla, and then a uh, Blood Eagle him. Um, for those who don't know, a Blood Eagle is an incredibly brutal Viking execution. <laughs> <laughs> where, um, yeah, hopefully, you're not yeah. eating eating uh, supper right now when you're when uh, Hitman describes this. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so you are, you're nailed to a, to a tree um, forwards, and um, with um, implements they break your um, your rib cage from behind, and then they rip out your entrails into the shape of a bloody pair of wings. So it is incredibly they pull brutal. Pull out your lungs and spread them. Yeah, they spread only the reserved it wings. for people that have greatly offended them. There is some argument, you know. I've I've been in uh there's been some arguments like in group chats i've been in over my, my scandy group chats over was the blood eagle real were we were we really that savage back in the day and you know there's a case to be made perhaps that it's exaggerated however however there is a rune stone in sweden which does appear to be depicting a blood eagle very similarly to how it's described so I'm I'm of I'm of Team Blood Eagle is very real. Um yes, and you know I'm, I'm sorry, but I I believe that humanity can be incredibly cruel and brutal when they want to be. So I, I don't think it's not, I don't think it's not impossible certainly, and it makes a much more interesting tale that that it's there and than the rather it not be there. So, uh, but <laughs> yeah, 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 So anywho, so King Ayla has been certainly been a memorable bloody. way to go out. Yes, certainly. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so anywho, so after the death of King Ayla, the Great Heathen Army don't stop there. They, as you can see on this map on the right, they advance south and they proceed to completely pillage and burn um, Anglo-Saxon England. Um, so they actually end up conquering um, most of Northumbria, uh, the eastern side of Mercia and all of East Anglia. Um, also, it's important to mention here that when I mentioned the Heptarchy before, uh, by this point, um, when I was reading that section about all the lineage of the kings of Wessex, there was a King Egbert or Egbert that was mentioned. Um, he was um, Alfred the Great's grandfather, and he was a very important, powerful king of Wessex because he was the one responsible for consolidating and conquering a lot of these smaller kingdoms. And so by the time you have the Great Heathen Army, there was actually only four Anglo-Saxon kingdoms the three main ones being Northumbria, Mercia, and Wessex, and then you've got the smaller one of East Anglia. Uh, so um, so the Great Heathen Army also actually conquer Essex from, from, from Wessex, uh, but they do manage to hold on to most of their territory. And um, there's just a few segments here I want to read about the passage of the, uh, the Great Heathen Army. So AD 867, this year the army went from East Angles over the mouth of the Humber to the Northumbrians as far as York, and there was much dissension in that nation among themselves. They had deposed their king, Osbert, and had admitted Ayla, who had no natural claim. Late in the year, however, they returned to their allegiance, and they were now fighting against the common enemy, having collected a vast force with which they fought the army at York, and breaking open the town, some of them entered in. Then was there an immense slaughter of North the Northumbrians, some within and some without, and both the kings were slain on the spot. The survivors made peace with the army, the same year died Bishop Ilstan, who had the bishopric of Sherborne fifty winters, and his body lies in the town. AD 868, this year the same army went into Mercia to Nottingham, and there fixed their winter quarters, and Bered, king of the Mercians, with his council, besought Ethered, king of the West Saxons, and Alfred, his brother, that they would assist them in fighting against the army. They went with the West Saxon army into Mercia, as far as Nottingham, and there meeting the army on the works, they beset them with them within. But there was no heavy fight, for the Mercians made peace with the army. AD 869, this year the army went back to York and sat there a year. AD 870, this year the army rode over Mercia into East Anglia, and there fixed their winter quarters at Thetford. And in the winter, 
King Edmund fought with them, but the Danes gained the victory and slew the king, whereupon they overran all that land and destroyed all the monasteries to which they came. The names of the leaders who slew the king were Hingwar and Hubba. At the same time came they to Medhemstead, burning and breaking and slaying abbot and monks, and all that they there found. They made such havoc there that the monastery, which was before full rich, was now reduced to nothing. The same year died Archbishop Caelnoth and Ethred, Bishop of Wiltshire, was chosen Archbishop of Canterbury. Yes, yeah, so that's the end of the bit of the Viking invasions. Uh, uh, was there anything you wanted to bring up before we move on to the, the next bit? Uh, just, just a small comment that in the Chronicles, when the word Dane is used, Dane generally does mean someone from Denmark. The majority of the great heathen army was Danish from what we know, although there were still uh, quite a number of Norwegians and some Swedes who were part of these invasions, but they were just lumped in as Danes. So if someone is referred to as a Dane, it doesn't necessarily mean they were from Denmark, but essentially all the Vikings were referred to as Danes. But by the time you get to the, the great heathen army, it's less of pirate small piratical bands and more of a, a an actually properly formal army going about raiding and pillaging and and making war it's a bit more conventional by that stage no, certainly and um again with this idea of um the term dane referring to um all um scandinavians um, it's also like how the anglo-saxons or english people were just called saxons regardless of whether they were saxons exactly. angles or jutes so it's just a collective term that was used indeed yeah yeah that's a great that's a great comparison there mm -hmm. okay uh, and so... i have noticed we do have the same translation so that makes it easy to follow oh well that's always helpful and then um, with the those names hingwar and hubba uh, I assume Herber is referring to Uber Ragnar's son. Would you agree, or I would assume so. It's it's close enough that, and considering the time and place, it's it's pretty much got to be Uber. But that is a challenge when you get to a lot of literature from this era, from around the North Sea. Is there isn't this standardization of spelling that has been passed down, so. Oftentimes, you do get variances in how names are described, so it can be it can be a challenge to track. Okay, who are they? Who's being referred to here? Um, yeah, the the versions of each name can get quite confusing. You even see that with popular figures such as uh, Ragnar Lothbrok, who is who is spelled in several different variances depending on how you want to take. The old Norse. And it's the same with the Saxons too, because obviously at this time the Anglo Saxons spoke Old English, which was far more Germanic than modern English. And you right. see that in in the name. So obviously we say Alfred, but they would have said uh, Alfred. Alfred, yeah. Uh, and Alfred means what? Elf? Elf Council? Uh, uh, I, I think it was Elf Friend, actually. Or elf Friend? Elf, yeah. It's, it's, yeah, what, it's, it's Elf something. Friend. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so I we really need to bring back. I mean, Alfred has fortunately stayed around, but we need to really bring back some of these old these old Anglo-Saxon names. There's just this uh, this great primal power to them. They're they're beautiful. Yeah, no, I agree. I mean, Ed Edward is the only one I think that's really in use. Um, the older name version being being Edward, uh, but no, since the uh, Norman Conquest, um, a lot of names people think are English are actually French. So you know, um, you, you know. Tom, Dick, and Harry. Well, two of those names are French, not English. If you uh, if you go back, really? so wait, which ones? Which ones are French? Uh, Robert and Henry are French oh, in origin. Right, yeah. Okay, mm. that's I didn't I didn't realize that. And, and Thomas uh, Thomas is Hebrew. So. Yeah, yeah, you do get you do get a lot of Hebrew names like like John sounds totally. That's about as uh, classically European sounding as you can get, or like a white person name. That you would think of, but it's yeah, of course it's Hebrew, but it's um, well, become so much ingrained that it's just kind of normal. No, 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 it's obviously the the biblical heritage. So, okay, so right, indeed, indeed, yeah. And here we come to the reign of King Alfred. So, uh, 
so here we've got two maps. So, uh, so what, what happens essentially is the Great Even Army carries on. Uh, there's several more battles. Um, critically, there's one known as the Battle of Ashdown, which is um, where um, you've got King Ethelred and his brother Alfred, who would then become Alfred the Great, uh, win a great victory, but they're, then they're defeated. Uh, Ethelred dies and Alfred becomes the king. And um, there's obviously a moment where the the, uh, the Vikings completely overrun uh, Wessex and he's forced to um, go off into the, the swamps um, for a while before he returns and is able to drive them out. Um, so, is Is this the point in which... In Alfred's life, where he resides in the village, um, and it what he's like scolded, he's in disguise and he's scolded by uh, yes, yes, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I yes. Mean, it shows his humility of being willing to to do that. Mm. Um, I think she scolds him because I think he burns her um her her buns or something. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. He's like bait, trying to bake, and he messes it up. Mm. Yeah, yeah, so oh, very... Alfred, you've done it this time. <laughs> Indeed. And um, yeah, so so a piece is eventually signed, and what ends up happening is you as on this map on the left, you see there is a petition um of England, um, of the kingdoms between um Alfred and the, the Vikings. So Wessex, um, as I said, keeps most of its territory, but it does critically lose uh, Middlesex, where London is, as well as Essex. However, they are able to retain uh, the western half of Mercia, while the Danes get everything else. And in the north, you can see there's a, a rump um, kingdom of Northumbria, um, which, as you can also see, um, for a time, Northumbria also included um, areas of no lowland Scotland. And... Um, it's also interesting in Scottish history that the Lowland Scots actually spoke a form of um, Old English um, rather than, than Gaelic. It was only later mm. when the Gaels conquered um, the southern parts of Scotland. And interestingly enough, they ended, the Gaels end up incorporating elements of... Um, because with, with the Old Scottish language, there's Gaelic, but there's also um, what's called Scots or Scots English, which is... Um, close enough to English that you can understand it, but there's lots of their, of, of its own dialect, if that makes sense. And a lot of that is derived from the Ang Anglo-Saxon um, inhab inhabitants of the Lowland um, Scotland. Oh, another thing just for the those listening to be aware of is that there's some, I mean, the portrayal of the Anglo-Saxons and the Jutes is really frustrating in contemporary media and, uh, and i mean that's where people get most of their conception even if even if you're not seeking it out it's it's very frustrating too because constantly i mean they're just portrayed and this is you know a symptom of the times that we're living in they're constantly just portrayed as these sort of weak effeminate um overly overly civilized people being just taken over brutally by these much more Hyper masculine Vikings coming in, and it's it's quite frustrating because you know they really wouldn't have looked in terms of their their physical appearance, in terms of their gear, they really wouldn't have looked all that different from the invading Vikings. And there's this yeah really annoying I think partly because it's this it's it's seen as socially socially fine to beat up on the English or socially fine to beat up on Christians. There's this constant subtle, subtle ways of framing the English as being yeah weak or the force that you should not root for. And it's, it's frustrating to see. Um, yes. Cause I actually watched your, your video on Assassin's Creed Valhalla. Um, oh, yeah. Because, uh... <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, yes, because um, you're not the only one. Because I think um, American Krogan also did a video on that game as well. And um, the things they they do in that game really made me quite angry. I'm never going to play that game because <laughs> it, it's yeah. It's, oh, it's I mean, it's, it is a, it, it is a, you know a, a murder simulator of killing <laughs> killing Anglo Saxons, and uh, yeah, like they're physically smaller in the game too, and and you see that it's not just limited to games. I mean, you see that like in the Vikings TV show, or or uh, yeah, a lot of the sort of popular Viking or medieval English media of the day, 
And also the armor is often, it bugs me because they'll often make the armor totally wrong in such a way that makes it a lot less cool. So it's like, okay, it's one thing if you're changing, you're going and doing something that's not historically accurate because you want to make something a little more stylish or cooler. But they actually downgrade the armor and the helmets and the overall aesthetic look of the Anglo-Saxons and even of the Vikings too, because they, they make them look a lot more primitive and a lot, a lot less stylish than they actually were. They actually looked incredibly cool. No, absolutely. And um, like, again, you talk about this presentation because um, one thing that does annoy me with this presentation is that all these Anglo-Saxon men are presented like they're modern-day Eng Englishmen um, speaking very refined and um, in, in modern in modern English. And it's well, <laughs> the simple fact was is that, as I said, old English was very Germanic. It had almost no Latin influences in it. If anything, they would have sounded more more like like the Northmen. And in, in if it's to be believed. Uh, Anglo-Saxons and Northmen could understand each other because the languages were similar enough. So, and I will say to to stick up for my my uh, Scandinavian bros, my my ancestors, uh, to stick up for them. There is, yeah, I will say there is a little bit of woe is me sometimes from from the good English folks about well, you know, Vikings were really mean to us and they were savage and they were backwards heathens, but we were. We were more, we were the more civilized, noble people. But again, we do have to. We only have to look a few hundred years back to see that the Anglo-Saxons were basically just Vikings going back a few hundred years. Not to not to discount the the important distinctions, but in terms of you know they were the the violent heathens just two or three hundred years prior. So, or not even in some cases, they they were quite similar. So. It is to say that the primary, you could say the primary civilizational difference between the Anglo-Saxons and the Vikings is just that the Anglo-Saxons were Christianized a little bit earlier than the Scandinavians. Yeah, no, Wait, no, would, no, you, no. would you agree to that? Would you say oh, no? That I, I, I would agree. I would, yeah, I would agree with that. Broadly speaking, the only real major difference is one was Christian and the and the other wasn't. So. And had had the situation, you know, had the Scandinavians become Christianized first, let's say the map was flipped and Rome was in the Arctic, then you would have probably seen a very similar situation happening in reverse. I don't want to get too speculative mm -hmm. historically because, of course, there, there are many reasons that history plays out the way it does. And the particular character of the Anglo-Saxons does have some key differences to to the Danes and to the Norwegians, etc. But but is it is just to kind of harp on this point that yeah, I mean these were all Northmen, these were all hardy, uh aggressive and dominant Northmen that were going about doing their thing. And they they really were not it was not like one one team of of wild wild Northmen who were beating up on effeminate, effete, high, oh, incredibly civilized Englishmen to their south. It was really, it was a contest of peers in many ways. No, no ab absolutely. And, um, okay, and what I want to do is, uh, there's just a couple other passages I want to read um, from the reign of King Alfred that sort of carry on the, um, the conflict um, between the Saxons and the Great Heathen Army. So I'm just going to bring that up. Okay, AD 871. This year came the army to Reading and Wessex, and in the course of three nights after rode two earls up, who were met by Alderman Ethelwolf at Englefield, where he fought with them and obtained the victory. There one of them was slain, whose name was Sidrak. About four nights after this, King Ethered and Alfred, his brother, led the main army to Reading, where they fought with the enemy, and there were much slaughter on either hand, Alderman Ethelwolf being among the skein, but the Danes kept possession of the field, and about four nights after this, King Ethelred and Alfred, his brother, fought with all the army on Ashdown, and the Danes were overcome. They had two heathen kings, Bagsag and Helfden, and many earls, and they were in two divisions, in one of which were Bagsag and Helfden. The heathen kings and the others were the earls. 
King Ethelred therefore fought with the troops of the kings, and there were King Bagsack slain, and Alfred his brother fought with the troops of the earls, and there were slain Earl Sidrak the Elder, Earl Sidrak the Younger, Earl Osborne, Earl Fren, and Earl Harold. They put both the troops to flight. There were many thousands of the slain, and they continued fighting till night. Within a fortnight of this, King Ethelred and Alfred his brother fought with the army at Basing, and then the Danes had the victory. About two months after this, King Ethelred and Alfred his brother fought with the army at Marden. They were in two divisions, and they put them both to flight, enjoying victory for some time during the day. And there was much slaughter on either hand, but the Danes became masters of the field, and there was slain Bishop Hetmund, with many other good men. After this fight came a vast army in the summer to Reading, and after the Easter of this year died King Ethelred. He reigned five years, and his body lies at Winburn Minster. Then Alfred, his brother, the son of Ethelwulf, took to the kingdom of Wessex, and within a month of this, King Alfred fought against all the army with a small force at Wilton. Along pursued them during the day, but the Danes got possession of the field. This year were nine general battles fought with the army in the kingdom south of the Thames, besides those skirmishes in which Alfred, the king's brother, and every single alderman and the thanes of the king, oft rode against them, which were accounted nothing. This year also were slain nine earls and one king, and the same year the West Saxons made peace with the army. Uh, AD871, and the Danish men were overcome, and they had two heathen kings, Bagsack and Halfdene, and many earls, and there was King Bagsack slain, and these earls, Sigrat the Elder, and also Sigrat the Younger, Osborne, Freen, and Harold, and the army was put to flight. So again, there you can see the two passages there, the second one there, though shorter retained some of the information that was in the other one. And um, I think also with the spelling of the names, again, I think that's from another version of the Chronicles. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. Yes, and so if we now just go to the map on the right, so essentially after lots of initial warring, um, there was a ceasefire, but later on... Uh, Alfred um, does go to war with the Danes again, and by eighteen by eight eighty six, um, he's able to conquer some more territory off of them. So, uh, if you notice, the two main gains are he actually manages to retake London um, from the Danes, uh, which is readmitted back into uh, Mercia, and he also is able to push in the northwest and um, actually take Manchester and parts of uh, Lancashire. And also, if you notice, the Kingdom of Strathclyde in Scotland pushes down as well. Um, taking all of Cumbria, so the, the so the Danes and territory in the northwest is significantly uh, reduced. Uh, so, uh, and it's also important to note that uh, du during this time, um, as well, uh, you can see that uh, with how it's labelled on the map, though uh, Alfred took the name in eight eighty six King of the Anglo Saxons. There was a degree of autonomy uh, required left with Mercia. Is there anything else significant that you want to um, bring up regarding the reign of King Alfred at all? Or? I mean, Alfred. Alfred is particularly interesting because he he does have this sort of he does kind of embody this warrior, but also has this sort of scholarly quality to him in, in a king. And he is this, I mean, he's this kind of pivotal figure in the formation of what we think of as England today. But I mean, without Alfred, I, I can't imagine there really even being English history as such. No, absolutely. No, he's incredibly um, defining um, for the, the Anglo-Saxons as, as a people. And because essentially with his victory, um, all of um, the Anglo-Saxons pledged fealty to him, all the ones that are not under Danish um, law, rule, that is. Because uh, I think there's actually another passage I wanted to read. Uh, yes, it's about the taking of London. I'm just going to give that a quick read as well. So, uh, okay. Oh, uh, yeah, so AD 886. This year went the army back again to the west, and that before were bent eastwards and proceeding upwards along the Seine, fixed their winter 
waters in the city of Paris. The same year also, King Alfred fortified the city of London and the whole English nation turned to him, except that part of it which was held captive by the Danes. He then committed the city to the care of Alderman Ethered to hold it under him. Uh, so one of the reasons why I believe um, Alfred's able to retake some territory as the the Vikings also decided to go attacking France and raiding Paris around the same time. So Alfred sort of was taking advantage of the distraction. Yeah. Um, would it be... <laughs> this is... I, I'm so... I'm just going to be I'm so embarrassed. I, I made a massive... Um, I accidentally promised to two things at the same time because I got my calendar all mixed up with time zones um would it be possible yeah i know i'm total i'm totally derailing the stream i'm so sorry i uh would it be possible to do some sort of intermission unexpectedly and then return to finish off the topic i know i'm, I'm totally derailing everything here um no no it's okay i uh, these these things happen i mean i'm more than happy to end it now and then maybe we could pick up the rest of this in another time i'm happy to do that yeah, because I, I, yeah, we've got so much good stuff to cover. I, I'll, here, you know what? I'll find a way to make up for this because, um, yeah, we'll, we'll finish this off and we'll have something great. I know we, we planned this out a while and I, yeah, this is again 100% my fault for, for a scheduling error I made. Uh, damn, UK time zones throwing me out here. <laughs> no, 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 but no, we've had a, we've covered a lot in an hour and I'm really happy with what we've discussed and I'm more than happy to have you back and that we can do do the rest at another time. So, okay, was there anything lads, you wanted to, 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 to shill at all? Or? Lads, subscribe to Hitman because we're going to finish this and have an amazing part two to this. Uh, I, I really appreciate how gracious Hitman is with, with this. Uh, but, yeah, no, I can't wait to see. I mean... Hitman's got some amazing content, so you guys have to check that out. Oh, well, thank you very much for that, uh, Nord Hugo. Uh, yep, so keep your eyes peeled as we will follow this up, hopefully in the near future. Uh, in terms of other streams for this channel, uh, I will be doing, I should be doing a stream next Friday with Marcus Furious Pertinax, and um, we'll be going over the book uh, My Reminences of East Africa by uh, Paul Von Lesser Vorbeck. Um, I should also be going on to... Um, Apostolic Majesty's channel next Wednesday to take part in a roundtable discussion on the grand strategy of Stalin's empire. So thank you very much all for watching and uh, see you next time.